for those of you who haven't heard me my story, I want to tell you briefly how I came to have this speech impairment. In June 2009, I was executive director of a community foundation and a civic leader. While I was having an unregistered car towed from a rental property I own in Akron, Ohio, I encountered the owner of the car, Michael Ayers. He was drunk and angry. He punched me in the face. My head hit a brick wall a few inches behind me at the speed of a high-speed car wreck. My nose was broken. My two front teeth were knocked out. I almost died, and I was unconscious for around six weeks. I have what is called a severe traumatic brain injury, or a TBI. We lost what many would call everything, job, new home, property, and social standing. My free-spirited wife became my 24-hour-a-day caregiver. Though I do continue to make progress, some of the damage will be permanent. The surprising thing about the assault that ended our lives is that we lived through it. In January, the Akron Birkin Beacon Journal ran a front page article in the Sunday paper about my willingness to forgive my assailant and to reach out to his family. People believe we're somehow special or saintly people to have forgiven this man. Well, what I want to share with you today is that my wife and I are not abnormally good people. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> but we know that the path of forgiveness can take ordinary people on an extraordinary trip. Four things. Forgiveness is practical. Forgiveness is liberating. Forgiveness is an attitude that can be learned. Forgiveness can be a way of life. Recovery has been a slow and difficult journey. Our hearts were broken wide open with our need for God and one another. We became outsiders to the mainstream of life we had known. We were able to see that the assailant and his family were suffering also. They too had had their lives changed overnight. Michael Ayers had gone into hiding the night of the assault and was nearly drinking himself to death. He was hiding from U.S. Marshals who were prepared to shoot him upon arrest. He was also taking huge risks to see his children, and we found out that he loves his kids, and they love and depend on him. Family members were being shunned at school and work because of what Michael had done and all the press coverage about it. His son, seven-year-old Michael Jr., was acting up in school and flunking the third grade. Four-year-old daughter Lyric was diagnosed with a serious illness. Both children cried for their father night after night.
to borrow from Harold Kushner, forgiveness is first and foremost a way of seeing. It cannot change the facts about the world we live in, but it can change the way we see those facts. Most people see my injury as a tragedy, but for my wife and me, it has created an opportunity to love more deeply. Auburn says one of the greatest moments in her life was the morning in November of 2009 when her husband, just like husbands the world over, sat up at the edge of the bed, yawned, scratched, and headed off to the bathroom in his underwear. <laughs> no nurses, no wheelchair, no breathing apparatus, no monitors, no breathing feeding tubes. We don't take the simple miracle of being alive or of having each other to love for granted. It is an attitude that we sustain each day. When Michael was finally arrested, we realized that seeing him get sentenced, well, though necessary, would not bring healing. What had helped us the most had been reaching out to his family. It was like we were the first ones standing up after an earthquake, and because our hearts were shattered, we wanted to help these other people to stand up Two, it helped us recover from our own pain. Who among us has not been harmed by the actions of another? Who has not experienced an injustice? Who among us has not experienced first or second hand a seemingly senseless Tragedy. We can make tragedy make sense when we allow it to help us find our way back to each other and to a place of love. When Michael learned that I had forgiven him, it was unbelievable to him. He told his significant other, Erica, he had never had such a strange feeling. He said he felt love like he never felt it before. There was a moment in the courtroom when he turned and looked in my direction. Our eyes locked. All of, I believe either of us saw in the other's eyes at that moment was compassion. One Sunday, Erica arrived at our church with Michael's youngest, Baby Langston. She stood at the lectern and read a heartfelt letter of apology from Michael Ayers directly to me in front of our congregation when I was preaching. Some would say he was playing us to get a lighter sentence, but we chose to be moved by it and, of course, to love baby Langston. Last spring, we got involved helping little Michael Jr., his son, who had been flunking the third grade, he knows me as Dr. Chuck. The first time we picked him up, he said, you're the man who is helping my dad, aren't you? Can you please tell me why my dad is in prison? He had 
heard. It was for spitting on someone. He went, it was really bugging him. And well, we made sure that Michael Sr. had a talk with little Michael. Now he knows that his dad is in prison for hurting someone, but he doesn't know that the person is me. I'm happy to report that Michael Jr. has made a turnaround since last spring, and his teachers are pleased with his progress. We'd like to help him, help him to do more than pass. We want to help him to excel. We receive weekly letters from Michael Sr. He has found faith in prison as well as help for his alcoholism. He thanks us constantly for our work with his son and tells us of his own progress. We would like to see him get back to being a good providing father to his kids and possibly a friend to us. According to statistics, men like Michael Ayers don't change. His future should look like his past. Alcoholic rage, bullying, and prison. It is between Michael and his own soul what path he ultimately takes in life. Our business is what is in our own hearts. It was just over two years ago that I incurred this brain injury, and I'm not done healing yet. <laughs> I'm swimming, golfing, and this year I ran my first 5K. Auburn and I call my brain injury our brain injury. It's something that we share in our marriage. We call Auburn occasional bouts with depression our depression. As we walk together with our imperfect lives in unconditional love and acceptance, we find the keys to great happiness and great freedom. When I was a successful pastor with a thousand plus parishioners, a thriving consulting business, a dozen investment properties, and several afternoons a week to devote to golfing, I used to say to my, I love my life. I'm doing what I was born to do. Now this sometimes struck people as presumptuous. It was like I was bragging and saying, I have it made. Well, it was true then. And although it may not seem so, it is true now. I have it made. I walk funny and talk funny and have a thousand impairments. Some are visible and some are invisible but I'm still exactly who I was made to be, doing exactly what I was born to do, saying exactly what I was born to say. And now that I have this brain injury to say it with, people no longer think I'm just bragging. <laughs> One of the greatest joys is when this life of ours, which includes our brain injury, can serve to inspire others. We probably wouldn't have arrived at such a surprising way of life without a, a knock to my head, but we're glad to be in a place where we can highly recommend it to you, <laughs> not the knock in the head, 
but the surprising way of life. I thank you very much for bearing witness to my story and for supporting me with your love. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.